You, an average person, do your weekly grocery shopping in a simple four-door sedan. Your groceries don't take up much more than the back seat because you have a terrible diet. This routine is nice, but sometimes you ask yourself, can I do this better? And then one day, a convicted fraud, pathological liar, and deranged narcissist walks up to you and says, hey, I have a semi-truck for you to do your weekly grocery shopping. What do you say? What? You say, no, Elon, that's dumb. Oh, we're coming out swinging. Good morning, everyone. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, here to take on space hoaxers, moon landing deniers, and to talk about aerospace engineering while doing so. I'm going to talk about more aerospace engineering today. I'd rather have coronavirus. Okay, so today's video is part one of the two-part conclusion to the SLS versus Starship debacle. I'm emphasizing debacle. The first video we looked at was, well, we're being critical of a video made by two SpaceX fanboys. I certainly kicked the hornet's nest with that one. So thank you all to those who watched and hated, and I mean, you're giving me attention that I never got as a child because I wasn't hugged enough by my mom. So thanks. And the last video from a few months ago was a look at how to lower launch costs on the launch vehicle side of things. As it turns out, Smarter Every Day made a video at the ULA Rocket Factory that had some of the same ideas in it. I, I didn't see that till after I was done. And now, the disappointing conclusion. A critical look at Starship. Does it live up to expectations? Is a revolution in space travel just around the corner? Will Starship blow the competition out of the water? Will it do anything that Elon says? Let's find out. Part one deals with the more down-to-earth of Starship's proposed uses. Oh, and a side note before we begin. In the long quarantine, I've actually started watching a few YouTube videos discussing the subjects we're about to talk about. I find them lacking. They're very surface level, one chart deep. They only talk about what SpaceX says they want to do and some of the historical basis of their design choices, but nothing more than that. There's no real critical look at, will this architecture work? Will it launch enough? So let this be a sort of start. That, that was a bit of a joke there. Uh, much like using rockets as airplanes. You see, the argument here is that Starship could be used as an intercontinental ballistic transport for people and cargo. I've also seen rumors and hints that it could be used as a troop transport too, but those are just speculation. Now, much like most of Elon's ideas, this isn't a new one. Back in the 50s, uh, a Redstone missile deli delivered mail to Maine from Florida. And some of Phil Bono's early SSTO designs were also sold as troop transports. Earth to Earth is incredibly unlikely to ever happen for two very broad reasons, operations and regulations. Now the two do blend together, but I'm going to try my best to keep them separate. The first question we must ask is who will operate the ICBT? Will SpaceX own and operate Starship on their own, or will they sell Starships to airlines, much like conventional aircraft? Setting aside right now the regulatory issues. And of course, I'd like to note here that both options have very thin profit margins so far. Second question is, how would it integrate into the current air traffic infrastructure? Not too well. 
Airports are generally situated in or near major cities, LaGuardia in New York, LAX, O'Hare, Atlanta, and so on. So you can see the problem here already. Rockets are usually launched three-ish miles away from the nearest person, just in case they blow up and due to the noise. Present day major airports can't support Starship. Noise regulations make this a non-starter anyway. Uh, no one wants a super heavy lift launch vehicle taking off in or near residential areas. It's really loud. Even if they could launch Starship at some airports, you'd still have to adapt your infrastructure to support them. You know, moving cargo in and out. How do you load cargo into the Starship? Where do you store Starship? If it's carrying passengers, where's the terminal? Uh, now, a lot of this does go under the regulations section, which we'll be covering later. I have a solution to the problem. Launch at sea. Yes, Elon and SpaceX have suggested using barges. This isn't a new idea. But it does solve part of the sound and airport problems. But it creates another one. When do you fuel Starship? How does this work? Do you put Starship on a barge, put the people on, tow it out, fuel it, and fly? Do you tow it out, fuel it, and then get the people on a slow-moving object towards a bomb? Hmm? And how is this simplifying anything? Third question. Where does Starship fly? See, the problem is, I don't need Starship to fly from here in Huntsville to Atlanta. And I can't see it doing much flight overland due to public fears of it you know, being a missile. Uh, though I should, should note that Starship breaking up in flight wouldn't be worse than a commercial jet breaking up in flight. So the real market I see for Starship in Earth to Earth would be transatlantic or transpacific flying. You know, Sydney to LA or New York to England. Though I suspect the English wouldn't like rockets landing on them ever again. Ah yes, fast flights across the Atlantic in a massively advanced aerospace vehicle. This doesn't sound familiar at all. And this requires the construction of new launch pads, landing sites, terminals, cargo loading and unloading spots, safety facilities, uh, and other infrastructure needed to support Starship. All within an industry with decades of history and marginal profits. How does Starship fix the current problems of air travel? Put the cart before the horse, though, unfortunately. Like anything that moves that's not on private property, Starship is bound by a whole slew of regulations. Is there any evidence of SpaceX working with any relevant regulatory bodies to make sure Starship is airworthy? No? That's not the half of it. Ever heard of ITAR? International Traffic and Arms Regulations? It's a set of laws governing what technologies U.S. companies can export, specifically those that are for weapon systems or could be made into weapons themselves. I advise you to read up on the Intelsat 708 launch failure. Now, that's the one where the U.S. built satellite was supposed to launch on a Chinese long march to geostationary orbit, but the long march failed and delivered the satellite to the next town over. Now, during the investigation of the crash, Chinese engineers got access to the satellite's guidance systems, which are notably better than theirs. Stunningly, the Long March got better shooting accuracy after that. Because of this, US satellites are now considered munitions and cannot launch on Chinese rockets unless they meet a certain design requirement. Oh no. Contrary to what Elon and the whole bunch of new space guys like to say, rockets aren't airplanes. But I can see the confusion sometimes. Now, if you're someone who works at ITAR or with ITAR or any of those organizations, Starship is not a launch vehicle. It's a missile. Or for the creative types, it's a hypersonic bomber. And as you can guess, this leads to a whole slew of issues. SpaceX can't sell or fly Starship to a whole bunch of countries. Iran, North Korea, China, Israel, and a whole bunch of others. Now, even with this imposition, SpaceX Starship facilities would still require a great deal of OPSEC, no matter where they are. Now, right now in the United States, the two major spaceports, this is easy. They're military facilities. 
To get access to them, you need security clearance or a special visitor's pass. And now, I know airports have uh, rigorous security requirements already for repair, you know, for the people that work there and passengers, but a rocket adds even more security requirements on top of that. It's a missile. If I was a nation interested in missile technology, the uh, engines, controls, guidance, navigation, especially the navigation, I would try my best to get a spy into a Starship repair hangar. Do you know why? The thing can land itself on a football field sized object from near space with great accuracy. Think of the tactical applications of that. Would everyone working on Starship need security clearances? How and how would you adapt these security clearance requirements to other nations? If Starship crashes in a foreign country, how will the investigation be carried out? Who gets access to the wreckage? Now, I'm going to assume right now there's probably already a legal framework in place from other commercial aircraft crashes, intellectual property laws, and 9-11 maybe. But it's still a missile. The big picture problem here is that ITAR limits where Starship can fly. Probably only to NATO countries. And tying into that, these countries have their own sets of rules and regulations regarding what would qualify as airworthy. So Starship has to be airworthy in these countries without compromising its design. Now, that would require me digging into like the FAA, seeing what they have for vehicles like Starship. And that's a lot of effort that I'm not going to be doing. Earth to Earth sounds nice, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Even if Starship could make it past the immense regulatory issues associated with, with it, this is still a rocket. Think of how many people could actually fly on it. How was Earth to Earth Starship not just worse Concorde? That was an air, advanced aerospace vehicle that could fly across the ocean fast, and it failed economically. And, it, and Concorde was a conventional design. Elon's unconventional. Elon isn't an answer. Earth to Earth is a nonsense ad hoc justification to prop up the system. We're not here to discuss the intricacies of air travel, though, because that's just boring. Instead, we're going to look at the real bread and butter for a vehicle like Starship. Space. This is obvious. Starship will eat the current launch market. It can carry every satellite and spacecraft and do it cheaper than the others. Can you name real payloads it's going to carry? No? It's really easy to talk about a rocket owning the launch market when its payloads are imaginary. I decided to analyze the launch market to see where a Starship fits in, since apparently no one else has done that. Uh, doing that, I looked at Space Launch Report for launches from 2019. This is because I did my research back in March for a video that was going to be made in April. That got delayed. Had I known this would have been delayed, I'd have gone back to about 2016 for my analysis. Based on data from the Space Launch Report, there were 56 launches to LEO, 7 to MEO, and 24 to GEO, Geostationary Transfer Orbit. Now, for my analysis, some of these payloads were dual manifested. So like a satellite stacked on another, there are ride shares. This does throw a wrench in my analysis. And for my LEO launch market, I did not include Starlink launches, the ISS payloads, and I also excluded those weird orbits only the Russians use. Side note, when I say geostationary orbit, I mean geostationary transfer orbit the really big elliptical orbit that has an apogee up at geostationary orbit. In normal launch conditions, the payload will separate from the rocket itself on its way up and do the insertion burn on its own so the upper stage can dispose of itself. You can have the rocket be designed to do the insertion burn by, on its own, but with most launch vehicles flying today, especially American ones, you're dealing with boil off and other engineering problems. So geostationary transfer orbit is specifically putting a payload on an elliptical orbit. Now, launch numbers don't mean much on their own. 
So for that, I averaged out the payload masses specifically for LEO and GEO launches. For the low Earth orbit market, the average uh, payload weighed 1.74, that's a four, metric tons. Now for the average GEO payload, they weighed about 4.5 to 6 metric tons. Again, very crude and dual manifesting kind of makes averages weird. How does Starship fit within this market? Well, let's take a look at its payload capacities. Well, I have the user's guide, so let's see what that says. Okay, so it can carry 100 tons to LEO. Cool, that puts in the same class as Saturn V, Energia, and the shuttle, technically speaking. Do the math. And Starship can carry every LEO launch from 2019. All up at once. Ah! Told you! Except those numbers are meaningless. A number of those payloads are national, which means they'd never fly on an American rocket. And then of those payloads that could fly on it, they're not all going to the same orbit. Not even the same inclination, so using a starship would be kind of pointless. And then of course, even if it did somehow amass all these different payloads, when would this LEO starship launch once a year? The third Tuesday in April? July 4th? So now let's take a look at the geostationary transfer orbit market. Now for starship, there are two ways you can do this. The first is the conventional manner of Launch, go into a parking orbit, go straight to geostationary transfer orbit, voila, like any other rocket. The second way is to have an intermediate step. Once you get into parking orbit, you refuel it, and then go to geostationary transfer orbit. So first, let's look at the conventional method. Uh, the user's guide says 21 metric tons to GTO. Oh, but there's some fine print. It says it's minus 1800 meters a second of delta V to go. So that's not GTO. This orbit, the, the purple one, it's a lot like geostationary transfer orbit in that it's, it's elliptical. But other than that, it, they're not. So in this case, once the payload is separated from the launch vehicle, it'll perform its own burn to get all the way up to geostationary transfer orbit, and then, you know, burn into orbit. Uh, SpaceX already does this with the Falcon 9, if you read its user's guide. I'm not sure about how the other people in the industry do this, but... Is that better than existing launchers? It's about the same as a Delta IV Heavy New Glenn, Vulcan Centaur, Long March 5, and Omega Heavy. And then a Falcon Heavy Expendable has better performance. Now that 14.4 metric tons to GTO does not include reusability penalties. I don't know how much propellant SpaceX intends to use for you know, the landing, how much it's needed, what the heat shield weighs, any of SpaceX's operational plans for Starship, as I'm just speculating here but I would suspect that that 14.4 goes down to somewhere near zero for a baseline geostationary transfer orbit. So with 14.4 metric tons of payload to GTO, assuming everything, uh, roughly 16 satellites per year with an average weight of the satellites between four and a half and six metric tons, this leaves about six to eight launches per year for those payloads. That's not too shabby considering other launch systems have similar launch rates. Now, assuming that there aren't too many issues with reusability and other foibles with the satellite industry, Starship could theoretically have some serious market control over it. Assuming that, you know, the costs are low enough. But 14.4 metric tons to GTO isn't that impressive considering Starship's size and complexity relative to other launch vehicles. So unless the satellite industry decides to start building monster geostationary satellites, Starship really isn't that relevant. Refueling then, what about that? So I see four options with Starship with refueling. Uh, the first is that it does simple geostationary transfer orbit burn after refueling and then comes back down somehow, with or without aerobraking. 
The second is that it does a geostationary transfer burn and then burns itself into geostationary orbit and comes back. Those are the four options because arrow braking might be involved. All right, so the GTO burn is about two and a half kilometers a second. That'll get it all the way up. And then up at geo or apogee or somewhere along here, it'll do another burn of about maybe 100 meters a second to lower the periapsis into the atmosphere for arrow braking. Then it'll do some arrow braking. I don't know the intensity or how much they plan on doing. And then landing burn will be about half a kilometer a second. Now that's from speculation I found online for how much Delta V is needed for a Falcon 9 to land. And I would suspect Starship has similar performance rates. Another thing is you need you know, extra propellant in case of boil off and for maneuvering. Now, with the 16 payloads massing between four and a half to six metric tons, that means Starship can carry 100 tons, it's about 100 tons, all the way up to GTO with two to four refueling flights, depending on how everything's all stacked in and you know, the weight of the satellites. But that's mass-wise. If you do the math for the size, physical size, of geostationary satellites, then the math doesn't really work out. Starship's payload envelope is a lot larger than the standard launch vehicle payload fairing. This is one of its big selling points. Now, I tried to figure out how many spacecraft it could actually hold. Now, the one thing I should note here that I've sort of drawn in is that SpaceX does mention like a turnstile type system for payload uh, carrying capacity. It is eight meters in diameter, so they have like a, a turnstile where you, you know, put a bunch of satellites on it, then they have an ejection system. To see how many spacecraft Starship could actually carry, I looked at the average geostationary payloads launched in the last two to three years, how big the satellite buses were. Now, excluding the really big Boeing 702MP bus, the average satellite was 1.79 by 1.91 by 3.1 meters in size. Now, in the best case scenario, it's the small dimensions will go on the bottom lengthwise. This is sort of how I drawn it here. I can't draw. And I use this equation to calculate how many satellites could actually fit in this area. The best case scenario is five in one of these. So you can see five with two fitting in this section because it's about 3.1 meters, depending on how much volume they need to you know, get shot out and stacking and all that. This could hold 10. Then the conical section could hold maybe two to four, depending on the system requirements, how well these react to you know, vibrations and all that. Since SpaceX only says they're going to do this, I can only really speculate on what they're going to do with the capabilities. If we include the 702 MP bus, then of course Starship can carry even less. So I estimate BFR can carry between 8 and 13 spacecraft per launch, which translates to about 36 to 48 metric tons of payload per, you know, for geostationary transfer orbit. Now, going back to our initial geostationary transfer orbit with refueling. So it's geostationary orbit, transfer orbit, plus an aerobrake maneuver to land. You end up with two payload launches and then two refueling flights for each set of payloads, translating to six launches per year. Now, if for some reason Starship can't aerobrake, for whatever reason, the heat shield doesn't like it, Elon doesn't want to do that, someone tweeted at him, I don't know, you'll need about 10 refueling flights to get back to juice to low Earth orbit than land, so 22 launches per year. Now, you can go all the way up to geostationary orbit with Starship, carrying these payloads. This is kind of a great, way, great use of the vehicle, actually, assuming boil off and engine restart and all that. So you can go straight up to geostationary orbit, equatorial, includes plane change, then you'll aero break down. Now I use the Wikipedia Delta V calculations for this because I'm lazy. Now it can't go back to Brownsville or like Kennedy Space Center. It's just too Delta V intensive. It'd have to land on a barge in, uh, you know, in the equator or somewhere around there. But you could do it with, with 10 to 11 refueling flights leading to 22 to 24 launches per year. Uh, keep those refueling flight numbers handy. So the other thing we have to take note here of here is down mass capabilities. How much can Starship carry down back to the surface of the Earth? Uh, much like the shuttle, it can recover satellites, theoretically. Now, with 12 refueling flights, I'm assuming that the 
tanker Starship can carry 100 tons of propellant. And since Starship has 1,200 tons of propellant, do the math. With no mass up to geostationary orbit, I should say here, with our geostationary with aero brake, zero metric tons up, you can get 37 metric tons down. With 36 metric tons up, you can carry 23 down with it. 48 up, 19 down. Of course, I'm making a few assumptions here. Uh, the big one here is that the grappling and recovery systems don't weigh anything and their volumetric constraints aren't, you know, enormous. This does lead to an issue with Starship actually is, is it, if it misses a satellite, if it can't deploy one, can it still land? Of course, when we look at refueling, this is where Starship fails. Huh? This is the problem with the entire setup and the mentality behind Starship. The satellite market isn't that big. So how many super heavies does Elon plan on building? How many tankers? How many launch pads? What on earth am I talking about, you're, you're asking? No matter how BFR is engineered, the booster and spacecraft will need to be refurbished, checked out, and readied for a reflight. Launch pads have the same problem too, since rocket launches aren't exactly, you know, gentle or subtle. Then, of course, you have to integrate the payloads, stack the boosters, check out the boosters, make sure they're ready for flight, roll them out to the pads, and spend some time there for final readiness. And then, of course, once it's all ready for launch, you're gonna have a delay because the sensor is bad, or your site got hit by a hurricane. So what I'm getting at here is that the refueling flights won't happen overnight. And I know SpaceX talks about rapid reuse of Falcon 9 and eventually Starship, but they've never demonstrated this. The fastest turnaround they've had so far is 51 days. So let's assume it takes one and a half months to get a launch pad and BFR ready to launch. Okay, so for our simplest geostationary transfer orbit plus aero brake mission, you'll need three flights. You've got your payloads, and then you got your two refueling flights. So now, if we have one pad and one booster, let's just say that, it'll be three months before your payloads go up to geostationary transfer orbit, right? They'll launch, they'll launch first at, you know, zero, and then it takes 1.5 months, two extra flights, that's three months. Now, if we have two pads and two boosters, this gets down to 1.5 months. That's still plenty of time in low Earth orbit, which isn't exactly a good thing because there's plenty of hazards up there, there's plenty of room for mechanical failure, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. You can imagine the issue if Starship goes directly to geostationary orbit. And this is the problem with a vehicle as oversized as Starship. How many do you build? Because if you build too few, then you're not going to get launches because they'll take several months to actually accomplish versus, you know, the few days it takes for a standard launch system. On the other hand, if you build too many, then you end up with a flurry of activity for a month or two, and then they send up, end up sitting in a hangar. So you end up building too many vehicles that are expensive in a hangars, which those cost money too, which means you're driving up your launch costs because they're just sitting there. And we're not going to get into insurance either, because guess what? Putting up 8 to 13 satellites owned by, you know, 10 different operators isn't going to make the insurance companies too happy, because they're thinking of, you know, eggs and baskets. So, unless there's a miracle occurs, insurance might make Starship nowhere near cost-effective. Which does bring to our final bit here. It's not exactly a big one, but it's there, is shooting accuracy. Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy have a high thrust upper stage, a really high thrust compared to other existing launchers. This means that at burnout and in vehicle performance, it's going to have less accuracy. This is one of the reasons why uh, Falcon 9 and Heavy haven't really been getting government contracts. Which does remind me, here's a good question. Falcon Heavy has the highest payload capacity of any existing launch vehicle and by definition the lowest dollars per kilogram to LEO. Yet, it is not a workhorse rocket. In fact, it's only flying about once a year right now. Not even. So, why isn't it getting all these payloads? SpaceX is assuming that there will be a massive explosion in satellite payloads and customers with the performance figures of Starship. But here's the thing. This didn't happen with Falcon 9, and I doubt it will happen with Starship either. 
In fact, the satellite industry has been in a multi-year slump. Besides, satellites aren't getting bigger and they're lasting longer too. So Starship doesn't have much of a real place in the commercial market right now. It's faulty logic here. A cheaper plane ticket to Hawaii does not make the hotels cheaper. Satellites are still very expensive and poorly drawn pieces of equipment. Now, could a cheap launch vehicle like Starship claims to be allow for lower satellite costs? Maybe. Now, for cost estimation, we'll be getting to that at the very end. You, you forgot Starlink. Oh, right. Starlink is a strange development. I didn't include it in my analysis for two big reasons, other than having a poor memory. Timing and business. We have no idea when Starship will enter operational capacity. The fanboys say, soon. It's right around the corner. Starship's an okay launch vehicle for a satellite constellation like Starlink, though I just don't know when it will come online and be ready to carry up Starlink. The other issue is, what is Starlink's planned replenishment rate? When will, the re you know, when will satellites need to be replaced and how many at a time? I just don't know. So I've left Starlink out of my analysis. I just don't know when Starship will be ready. That's the thing. Uh, Starlink is part of SpaceX, so I don't consider them a separate commercial entity. The other issue is it's hard to tell if Starlink will be successful. There is a business case for satellite internet. It's been around for a while now, but the problem is most analysis I've seen for Starlink use magical figures and numbers, so I don't know what to make of it. The other issue, of course, is that Starlink doesn't have ground stations, you know, the, the part that makes it work, and other vital business things. So, I don't know. Plus, Musk's companies have a history of not making money, so... What about the moon, Mars, the solar system, and what about low costs? Worse. 